He was on the Sanhedrin, who came to Jesus one night in the cloak of darkness to find out what this Jesus God was all about. Because Nicodemus was also a teacher. He knew that Torah. He knew every part of it. He was, in his day, as they say, the Billy Graham of first century Jerusalem. Because he knew what was in that Torah. And that's what he gave his students and his people who came to him for knowledge and enrichment of God's word. So when he met with Jesus, Jesus' message, well, the first question that Nicodemus had to Jesus was, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who's come from God. For no one can perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not within you. And Jesus replied, Amen. I tell you the truth. And he says, I tell you the truth three times in these conversations that he's having with Nicodemus. So he wants him to make, really understand where this is coming from. I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Well, of course, Nicodemus, the teacher, was very confused. And his question was, how can an old man be born again? Or how can a person re-enter their mother's womb to be born again? Jesus explained that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born in the water that we know as the baptism and in the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. So you should not be surprised, Jesus told you, that I'm telling you that you must be born again. When the wind blows, it blows wherever it pleases. You hear it surround you, but you cannot tell from what direction it's always coming. So is it with everyone who is born in the Spirit. We pick up the scripture this morning in John 3, verses 14 through 21. If you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, please do so. Just as Moses lifted up that snake in the wilderness, so is the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. But this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed by whoever lives the truth comes into the light, so that it may seem plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have to believe that these teachings that Nicodemus came to Jesus for changed his life as a teacher. Some scholars have questioned why Nicodemus came to Jesus. Most believe that Nicodemus had heard Jesus preach. He heard what his message was. And he realized for the first time that he had some questions that even as a teacher, of God's word of the Torah, he didn't have all the answers. So this prophet, this man from Galilee, this Jesus, could give him some of those answers. That was one perception. Another scholar said, well, maybe Nicodemus was sent there by the Pharisees to check up on Jesus. <coughs> but what Nicodemus walked away with was learning about our salvation and that we are aching to be born 
to be born in Christ and live fully our salvation through him. Nicodemus is mentioned three times in the Gospel of St. John. The first one is what we just read. When he came to Jesus and he wanted to know what's happening, what's going on. I don't, I don't understand what you're telling others. The second time is in, is in John 7, 45 through 52, where he intervenes in favor of Jesus with the Pharisees, one of his, as being one of their own. He did not think that they were being fair to Jesus, that they were not going, they weren't bringing him in and saying, what's your story? What are you doing out there? In other words, getting the information from the horse's mouth rather than believe the gossip and the innuendos and their own judgments against Jesus. Later, in John 19, 38 through 42, we learned that it was Nicodemus who assisted Joseph of Arimathea in preparing Jesus' body for burial. We have to think that Nicodemus was a very rich man. Because scripture says he brought 75 pounds of spices, of myrrh, which was very expensive, and of aloe that were to be wrapped around the body. And he did those strips of linen. He put the spices inside those strips. He helped Joseph wrap the body of Jesus. And he helped Joseph put Jesus in the tomb. Now the tomb, you may remember, Joseph of Arimathea, we assume he was an older man at the time, because this was his tomb, and he gave it to, to Jesus and his followers for Jesus to be laid in this tomb. Our question today, are we aching to be born? In his book, Journey into Christ, theologian Alan Jones said, there is a self within each one of us aching to be born. And when this aching breaks into our lives, we must somehow find the courage to say yes. Yes to the more real, more Christ-like self struggling in us to be born. I dare say that most of our salvation stories are very similar and also very different. Many of us came to Christ the first time because of an illness, or a crisis in our life, or simply that we could no longer live the life that we were involved in. We had to call out to God and His Son for help. And in those times of struggle, we were aching, we were looking for a rebirth of our lives. Some people were not raised in a Christian home, or may have been raised in an abusive, evil home. But they always knew that there was something better. There was something that they were missing. And they later discovered exactly what it was. And maybe it was through the intercession of a good neighbor, or a spouse, or a friend. Maybe it was the first time that they picked up that book and read the Bible for the first time. Maybe it was someone praying for them and praying with them. Then they discovered it showed them all of these things that came together, that Christ was what was missing in their lives. And they were not only aching to be out of their situation or away from it, but they were aching to be born in Jesus. As Methodists, as most Christians do, we believe, although as Methodists, we believe that baptism is one of our sacraments. It's one of the sacraments of the, of the Methodist Church. Because it's the work of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, which by grace washes away our sins and makes us become children of God. As in the scripture today, it says that you are born in water, baptism, and the Holy Spirit, you are born again. But have you ever wondered about people who live their life in Christ? They were leading really good Christian lives and suddenly they allowed the evil one to come into their life. They, they either backtracked or they went anew to something that was not of Christ. God offers us salvation, 
and we remain, but we remain free to refuse that help that is offered. And yet, we can walk away. The Reverend Taylor Burton Edwards, who served as Director of Worship Resources with the uh, Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church from 2005 to 2018, referred to the teachings and writings of our founder, John Wesley. He writes, the theology of John Wesley says that salvation is both something God does and in which we cooperate, though it's not equal by any means. Only God can initiate our salvation, but only by our ongoing, outgoing, living relationship with God through faith can God's saving intention be fully realized in our lives. Christ's saving activity in life death and resurrection is effective for all. Only faith, which is an exercise of our will under the influence of His divine grace, is required of us. We can fall into grace. As Wesley said was a phrase that he brought out of Hebrews 6 and 10 but not sustaining our faith. A lapse in our faith is a sign. John Wesley wrote a sermon one time, and he called it a call to backsliders. Because he said that there wasn't only one or two backsliders within his own congregation, or within all the people that he had been circuit riding and preaching to and going from place to place and bringing the word of God to. He said there were not hundreds, but he expected thousands. In every place where the arm of the Lord has been revealed and many, many sinners converted to God, there are several who found the way to turn their backs on God. But others, innumerable amounts, are the interest and the people who are kind and loving, not only to those who have fallen away, but to each other. Indeed, it is so far from being an uncommon thing for a believer to fail, to fall, and be restored, that it's rather uncommon to find any believers who are not conscious of having been a backslider from God at one point in their lives. His point is that despite whatever condition that our souls are in, God is always calling us and wooing us and pleading with us and working and leaving a way open for us to experience our faith, to renew our hearts and to be quickened by grace and our souls to be brought back to health and life. As in the theologian, Alan Jones, he said there's another metaphor about drinking at the spring. Because God's living waters is what calls our soul to him. And when we fall away and we re-embrace those drinking waters, we can become and continue to be the Christians that he calls us to be. There's, our salvation is always there. But if we walk away from that salvation, God is always there with his son to call us home and to call us back into the fold. And that's what we need to remember. We especially need to remember that during this Lenten season because we are praying for each other. We're doing acts of kindness. We're sharing the word of God with our friends and our family, hopefully through Facebook and social media and through just picking up the phone and saying, I love you, send them a card, something. That's what Christ calls us to do as disciples, to be part of his church, to be part of his life, to bring him and his only son, who he gave for, to us, to others. There's a Christian author by the name of Sue Mock Kidd, and she writes that on a very cold February day, she was having a really bad struggle saying yes to God. So she decided to leave her house and go for a little walk. So as she's walking, burling into the wind, covered up, head down, 
All of a sudden, she glances up, and something caught out of the corner of her eye. She didn't know what it was, so she kept walking. And then she hears the voice, stop, look up. Stop walking. She keeps walking because she's thinking, all right, I'm losing my mind. It's cold out here. I need to go home. Stop. Look up. Stop walking. So she did. As she looked up and walked back under this big tree, she saw on one of the branches, a twig, that there was something brown hanging off. So as she walked up to look at it more carefully, she touched the tip and she felt light. And she said at that moment is when she had that reverence and she wanted to fall to her knees and not only say yes to God, but she wanted to say yes to life. She doesn't tell us what was going on in her life, what her struggle was. We knew at the point she wrote this story, she was a very prolific Christian writer. But we don't know what she was before. Was she one of the ones who had backslid? Was she one of the ones who came to church and sat in their pew and went home every Sunday and didn't look at that word of God any longer or didn't pray for other people? We don't know that. But that light in a tiny, tiny brown cocoon stirred Christ in her heart. She said that she knew that at that moment, God was speaking to her about her own transformation, about the descent and emergence of the soul, and about hope. So she broke off that little twin, and she took it to her home, and she said she taped it to her crab apple tree in the backyard. And she would stand in her kitchen window and look out on that little cocoon. And it revived her. And she said it looked like an upside down question mark as it was hanging from the branch. Live the question mark, God whispered to her one day. So Sue, for the first time, understood and acknowledged dissent into her heart. She writes, crisis changed and a mirage of upheavals had blistered the spirit and left me groping. They aren't voices of simple pain, but also of creativity. If we would listen, we might hear that such times are beckoning us to a season of waiting and to a place of fertile emptiness. Powerful words because she needed that cocoon. She needed the renewal of her life. And the message aching to be born in Christ became part of her heart. She needed the grace that God sends us in that simple way every day. And she needed to listen to her inner voice, to hear God's whisper, and to recognize her own salvation, hope, and transformation. So during this Lent season, who are we going to find in Christ? Whose lifeline or cocoon are we trying to be? Are we the ones that need to say that we're aching to be a part of God? It could be about letting go and letting God. In her daily devotion book, Carol Mead, a book is called Holy Lord. It's been in print for 20-something years. It's a wonderful daily devotion. Carol Mead recalls that she saw a film called Into the Arms of Strangers. And that film told of Jewish, of German Jewish children who were sent away from the Nazis during World War II so they wouldn't end up in the camps. They were put on trains. And one woman in the film talks about when she was a child and they put her on this train to go into the arms of strangers, to go to a better place. Her father gripped her hand so tightly and would not let go because he loved her so much. 
that he pulled her off the train. She eventually went to Auschwitz. I can certainly relate to Carol's own story when she tells the second part of that devotion about holding her dying father's hand because she loved him so much. She wanted him to stay with her forever. And she said she couldn't give her grief to God because she felt so shallow and so hurt and guilty that she had not done everything that she could for her father. That that guilt and that raw hurt kept her from God. When my father was dying in 1988, I did the exact opposite. I'm proud to say I was able to express my grief and I went into the chapel of the VA hospital and got through the grief. And I prayed to God to take him. Because he had a cancerous growth that had started on his vocal cords and had spread throughout almost every vital organ of his body. They were just waiting for him to go into a coma. While we lied to him, telling him he was going to get out of the hospital the next week. The doctor gave him the hours on Thursday when I arrived until the weekend. They said, he won't be here Sunday. What are you going to us? He hung in there Tuesday. He did go into a home. But I held his hand in an ICU. And I watched that fluid that was drained out of him. But I held his hand and I prayed. And I went to that chapel and I prayed that God take him to relieve his suffering. Because that's the best thing I could do as a Christian, is to put that in God's hands. To let it go. And let God take my father to the great reward in heaven. To be with him. To see his Jesus face to face. The Jesus that he had told me about as a child. He introduced me to him. It was his time. Carol eventually understood, as I did, that God perfectly understands how much we hurt. Because when she said, you don't understand my pain to God, how could God not understand that pain? He gave up that one and only son for us. He put him on that cross. He wouldn't take him off that cross. But he gave us new life through Christ. He gave us our salvation. And he gave us a future of blessings, being as one part of his family. When she talked about her excruciating pain of not being able to let go, there's a Latin word for excruciating that means to crucify. So that should have been her first example of God knows exactly what he's going through, what you're going through, and that you're saying that God is something you love. In closing this week, I hope that you will think about your own born again time. When did you first accept salvation from Jesus? How has it blessed, enhanced, and changed your life? If you aren't there yet, if you aren't where you really think you need to be, reach out to someone who is. Reach out to Brother Lee, reach out to myself, reach out to, to Phyllis Richard, Karen, people that you see every Sunday, that you know in your heart they found them, they found them, their salvation. Let them guide you. Just go to them. And you know what I can offer you. But Lord, I know what you offer me. Bring those needs and that love to God. You guys have a